today's webinar. My name is Sierra Pilecchio and I am the program coordinator of the Hep Delta Connect program here at the Hepatitis B Foundation. And we're very excited to present today's session uh, called Hepatitis Delta, the Hidden Epidemic. So before we get started, I'd like to review a few housekeeping items and let you know how you can participate in today's webinar. Please note that all attendees are in listen-only mode and will be muted during the presentation. And there's a phone-in option and the call-in numbers are below. And if any, at any time so anyone wants to submit questions in writing during the presentation, please type them in the question box on your GoToWebinar control panel. We will be reviewing them as they come in and we'll hold a Q&A session after the presentation completes. And finally, today's webinar will be recorded and you will receive an email with a link to view a recording of today's presentation after the webinar. So now I'd like to introduce our presenter today, Prof Professor Consultant from Stanford University and our own medical director, Dr. Robert Gish, uh, who will be presenting today's webinar. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Gish. Thank you, Sierra, and thank you very much to the Hepatitis B Foundation and the Hepatitis Delta Connect program. This is very, very important, and we're very proud to have such a large number of attendees and so many interested people that are involved with our program. And Sierra, I'm just trying to get the slides to go forward, and they are working. That's great. So let's talk about the numbers worldwide. Right now, we think there's about 240 million people infected with hepatitis B, 170 million with hepatitis C, and we think Delta infection is currently present in 15 to 20 million people. So this is a very large number, and we'll be digging in deeper and deeper into why that number is so important. Delta is the most severe form of chronic viral hepatitis. We usually quote a 20 to 40 percent risk of cirrhosis with hepatitis C. We quote somewhere between 15 and 35 percent for hepatitis B. But with Delta, we're talking about a 70 percent risk of developing cirrhosis, seven out of 10, and a significantly higher risk of liver cancer, maybe from the infection itself or the higher risk of cirrhosis or both. The clinical manifestation of hepatitis delta differs between regions, but we're talking about delta infection causing either acute hepatitis or cirrhosis. So the clinical manifestations look like with acute disease, like you might see with A, B, C, uh, and uh, E, or chronic disease, like you might see with hepatitis C or B. But we're going to talk about epidemiology, how this presents region-wide. This is a dynamic disease because B and Delta both contribute to the risk of disease progression or the actual disease itself. Who is at risk of Delta? Immigrant populations. There are specific geographies of the world. And we're going to talk about who you test for Delta with a Delta antibody testing. And if the antibody is positive, you're going to reflex the Delta RNA. Genotype is a research issue. You can't obtain genotyping clinically, but I think it's fascinating to look at the genotype issue, and I'll comment on that shortly. This is a very detailed map where we know the numbers, high, intermediate, low, very low, and no data. We do have quite a bit of data from Mongolia, so this is just recently was going to be updated with a paper published in Hepatology from Jeff Glenn and his group and his Mongolian colleagues. But you can see very interesting pockets of Delta, such as the Upper Amazonia and the Orinoco River Valley in Venezuela, multiple countries in Central Africa, Mongolia is very high, and of course, Eastern Europe. Low is the U.S. and Western Europe, but immigrant populations in those countries can be high or very high. We're going to talk more about this soon. Genotypes. 
here we have listed between one and seven genotypes. This has more to do with how severe the disease is, and I'll just jump to an example. In South America, genotype 3 has a very high risk of fulminant hepatitis as an interesting example. Asia-Pacific region, we usually think, oh my gosh, Delta, it's going to be Sub-Saharan Africa, it might be Mongolia, it might be Eastern Europe, but we're finding hepatitis Delta in a number of countries in Southeast Asia. Taiwan has had a mini epidemic in IV drug users and in sex workers, but that has spread into the general population. Pakistan has a very, very high Delta infection, much, much higher than in India. So we're not exactly sure why there's this concentration, maybe genotype dependent, maybe behavior dependent. This goes into a little bit more detail. This is the EASL Delta conference that was held in Turkey and a number of different posters. So you can see in India, for instance, you're talking about a 10 to 15% rate in patients who are hepatitis B positive. And remember, you have to have hepatitis B to have Delta. Delta doesn't um, live by itself. This is a very small partial RNA virus that has some relationship to plant viruses, actually. And it requires the Delta. Delta infection requires the hepatitis B virus replication machinery, specifically surface antigen, to be infectious and move either in the body from one liver cell to another or to move from one human to another. But back to Epi, look at the numbers in Pakistan, 45%. Iran, 8% or so. In Turkey, there's a gradient from northwest, relatively low, to southeast, relatively high in the Kurdish region. A little bit more about Africa with a blow up of some specific countries and unfortunately in many countries we don't have any details. But my rule is persons from sub-Saharan Africa and they have hepatitis B, they get tested for Delta. Any patient with cirrhosis gets tested, even if they're from North Africa. A little bit more on the different genotypes. And this actually shows all the way out to genotype eight. One, five, six, seven, and eight are the genotypes seen in Africa. A little bit more about Europe, Romania, Moldova, southern part of Lithuania, Albania, Turkish gradient, west to east. And a lot of this has to do with behavior. We think it has to do with medical injections in many of these countries, although there may be pockets in IV drug use and sex workers as well. There's been a decline in Delta prevalence in Eastern Europe in the 1990s. We think this is because of interventions, including vaccination for hepatitis B, safe sex, uh, needle exchange, improvements in medical care, and a decreased use of reusable sharps in the medical setting. A little bit older data in the U.S., dependent on who you tested. It could be as low as 1%. Could be as high as 30%. This is data all back before 1993. So we're going to get into a little bit more current data on Delta in the US. CDC 2003 to 2004 had about a 4% risk of Delta and hepatitis B surface antigen positive individuals. But remember, N. Haynes is a very special study. It did not look at six subgroups of individuals who are at high risk for viral hepatitis, so low socioeconomic, prisons, veterans, et cetera. So in Haynes, they quote these numbers, but we can't hold on to those numbers as being representative of a general population or special populations. This is Hepatology 2016, a little bit more data from the CDC, 71,000 prevalence of Delta in the U.S. was quite low. And again, this had to do with special testing, special populations, not necessarily representing the higher risk people where we might see those um, individuals. So let's take a look at this. We're finding Delta positive. That's in the third column over, a little bit more in men. We're high, finding higher in non-Hispanic blacks 
and in other ethnic groups. And of course, that's going to be immigrant populations, which may include Mongolia. Uh, there was a risk of co-infection. If you have B and C, you have a higher risk of Delta. And there's even a higher risk if you have B and HIV or B, C and HIV. And um, homosexual uh, exposure would be one of the risk factors. What about more information in the U.S. population? It hasn't been assessed widely, but let's look back at Baltimore. Baltimore was heavily looking at IV drug use population, and they had a 15% prevalence in an earlier study in the late 80s. And in the 2005 to 2006, they had an 11% incidence in their IV drug use population. Uh, the U.S. veteran population was recently looked at, and there was about a 3.5% prevalence in the VA. But if you look at this paper in detail, it was a huge amount of under-testing. So highly variable, depends on what population you look at. And we're going to advocate testing, not every patient who's surface antigen positive, but we're going to talk about people who are at risk. So that could be uh, cirrhosis very active liver disease, even if their hepatitis B is suppressed. If they've had sexual exposure to hepatitis B, they could have sexual exposure to Delta. It, um, IV drug use, that would be another risk uh, for exposure, and also contaminated medical injection. In 2013, we looked in Northern California at approximately 500 individuals that were tested, which we had complete data. Delta antibody positivity was found in 8% of that group, and we had a wide range of individuals, including 28% were from the Asia-Pacific region. 34% were tri-infected with hepatitis C, B, and Delta, and as you heard before, there's about a 70% risk of cirrhosis. That's what we found in this population as well. They've had to do a little bit numbers in the VA, digging a little bit deeper from the Kushner uh, group uh, with Dr. Uh, Shapiro. And predictors of being Delta tested was male gender. And interestingly, in the uh, VA population, they were testing Asians for Delta, which is important. These patients were more commonly hepatitis B core IgM positive. That doesn't necessarily mean they had a higher risk of acute uh, hepatitis B. It just meant that their liver disease was more active. Interestingly, they're a little bit more common to be E antigen positive, but there was incomplete data. We talked about hepatitis C and HIV previously. Definitely more active liver disease. ALTs uh, were quite high in the Delta population and that those tested for Delta. And the patients also uh, with higher DNA levels. Now remember, when you have Delta infection, Delta takes over for hepatitis B. It dominates. Most patients have low DNA, HPV, DNA quant levels. And some patients may be completely undetectable even if they're not on treatment. On treatment, if you have a patient whose DNA is negative, but the liver enzymes are above 60 to 80 IUs for, say, the ALT and AST, you would say their B is suppressed. Why are their liver enzymes high? And those patients all need to be checked for Delta. But of course, you need to think about NASH and fatty liver as well. This just had to do with this VA population, higher risk of being hepatitis C infected or tri-infected, or some patients may be tri-infected with HIV, hepatitis B, and Delta. It's interesting that there was no differences in age, ethnicity, or comorbidities in the Delta-positive individuals. A little bit more back on an article published in 2010 from Kursika. Uh, this is uh, including um, injection drug users from around the United States and also Canada. Jordan Feld was a co-author on this uh, study. And this walks through with those patients who are positive for Delta, giving a little bit more information in the right column. Of course, you need to be surface antigen positive, be checked for Delta. Um, and those patients may have a variety of different types of liver disease. So it's uh, just important to think about this.
general population. This is some CDC information that was published up through 2016. What they did here is went back and dug a little bit more deeply into those surface antigen patient populations and came up with different numbers who are delta positive. So this is retrospective testing by different year cohorts and they found a wide variation in patients who are delta uh, positive, but they really didn't see a decline over time. That's really the message on this, that the delta uh, prevalence for antibody appears to be stable, at least between 13 and 16, and higher than in the um, 2002 to 2012 period. So the testing algorithm that the CDC has proposed, it was shown at ASLD last year, surface antigen positive consider delta testing. Now my advice is not everybody needs delta. So blood exposure through some type of high risk behavior and or if they have advanced liver disease. And finally, if they are hepatitis B suppressed, either off treatment or on treatment but have high liver enzymes strongly considered delta antibody testing and then reflexing to delta RNA. And we'll talk about how to get delta RNA testing done in a few moments. Now, we have a lot of different tests that are available for hepatitis B surface antigen, uh, ortho, Abbott, Roche, a variety of different tests, but we don't have that many tests for delta antibody. We think the delta antibody is accurate uh, meaning it's sensitive, but that sensitivity may range between 80 and 90 percent. So what that may mean is, is that we may be missing in the U.S. or globally where we're testing for Delta, we may be test missing 10 to 20 percent of individuals. So there are uh, improvements in Delta antibody testing, including uh, research that's coming out of Jeff Glenn's lab that may be more accurate. So if you have a patient historically that you checked for Delta and the Delta antibody was negative and you ruled out Delta because the antibody was undetectable, it was new antibody tests become available, you may decide to retest them or you could take a step forward from the algorithm and say, I think this patient has Delta. I don't believe the negative antibody results you may then order delta RNA testing quantification. This is a very, very important um, uh, graph. So how good are we at testing for delta? This is 25 different labs that submitted information to a major centralized lab, and it showed the high variation between a test that was from a standard and what the different laboratories actually showed for what the quantification was. And importantly, didn't show on this graph, but on another uh, part of a publication, few of the labs showed negative for delta RNA. This, again, this is an RNA graph. But if you have a standard, you know the number, and you're looking across different labs, and one lab is telling you two logs, another lab is telling you six logs, you may not be getting an accurate result back. But we believe that in the U.S., where we have standardization done at the CDC and also a lab in Salt Lake City called AREP, we think that we have reliable, accurate, and sensitive tests for delta RNA to help confirm or deny active infection. The probably 20% of patients who have delta antibody are negative for delta RNA. Now this could mean the delta RNA is less than detectable, or it could mean that they've cleared and been cured of their hepatitis delta infection. So delta virus is an RNA virus. Almost all RNA viruses are curable. The only exception that I can bring forward immediately is HIV, which is an RNA virus, but it's a retrovirus. Delta is a partial RNA virus, meaning it's dependent on hepatitis B for replication. You can cure Delta through natural clearance or through treatment. We'll talk about treatment in just a little bit. This just shows where patients have come from that were tested in the CDC. US 
face, the U.S. born, but we also have patients from Ukraine, as Eastern Europe, Mongolia, which we expected, Sudan. Now, Sudan is in the region called the Horn of Africa, and Delta infection is endemic in Sudan, Ethiopia, Eritrea, Djibouti, uh, and Yemen. So any patient from the Horn of Africa should be tested for hepatitis B. If their surface antigen positive, they should be checked for Delta. Liberia, which is West Africa, is another location. Um, Ghana, also Southwest uh, Africa, uh, near, near Nigeria. And there's even a patient from Vietnam. Vietnam is probably the Asia Pacific region. But uh, Delta infection is found in Vietnam, is found recently in a large cluster in Hanoi, although that population was special in that they were IV drug users. What about where in the country were tests for Delta sent to the CDC? Pennsylvania dominated, but we got samples from Texas and California as, for, as a variety of other states, including Utah. Actually, Dr. Terry Box in Utah just sent me an email today that he had found another Delta infection patient in Salt Lake City. So this just looks back and talks about uh, antibody being positive in U.S. specimens through the CDC. And what shows on this slide, which I really want to focus on here, is Delta RNA being positive in about half of patients who are antibody positive. So not every patient has ongoing Delta replication. I tend to follow the 70% rule, but this is a little bit lower. May have had to do with storage and shipment where uh, Delta RNA may not have um, uh, been, um, um, should be measurable because it may have broken down during storage or shipment. A little bit more about genotypes. It looks like genotype one and five are dominant in the US but they did find genotype two and six uh, as well, as well as genotype four, eight, and three. So in summary, small number of samples are received for testing. And that's one of the purposes of this call and this presentation, is to think, get you as providers in the hepatology community and we know that we have hepatologists on the line, infectious disease, nurse practitioners, pharmacists, uh, PAs, uh, um, uh, primary care providers that are interested, advocates, people that are testing in community settings. And what we really need is to have you think about Delta antibody in your patients at risk, have a very low threshold to check for antibody, it's an inexpensive test. I think the antibody test costs is less than $60. And then if they're antibody positive, we now have a reliable assay at AREP in Salt Lake City. And you can connect through our program on how to get that Delta testing done or send that directly to AREP. Very important messages. This is the group that we've been working with at the CDC. And my really, um, my go-to patient is, as my go-to person is uh, Dr. Hayden, whose name's been on all these different slides. But uh, Dr. Kimili has helped a lot. Uh, Jan Dobrovinek has also helped immensely, as well as the other colleagues. And my Delta guru in the United States is Dr. Robert Perillo. So, is Delta really low prevalence in the uh, Vietnam region? And we're saying that we are finding a substantial number of Delta positive patients in Vietnamese individuals. I do want to reinforce that uh, this did to be uh, concentrated in patients with needle exposure and uh, high IV drug use. So let's step back just for a second and remember that you could get Delta together with hepatitis B at one moment. That's called co-infection. So we have different terms for co-infections, but we're talking about acute co-infection. Those patients tend to clear Delta infection. They even have a high chance of clearing hepatitis B, but they can get very, very sick, be jaundiced, have liver failure, die, or need um, a liver transplant. So that's co-acute infection. Super infection is when you have chronic hepatitis B and then you do something risky or have a risk event, and then Delta infection 
comes in on top of chronic B, and those patients tend to have chronic delta long-term. They don't tend to clear delta, and they don't clear hepatitis B. As you know, hepatitis B is incurable. Even if you clear surface antigen, we might use the word functional cure, but remember that's an oxymoron, just trying to build a little um, optimism in the hepatitis B world. Once you have hepatitis B and your core antibody positive, you've got hepatitis B. That patient has hepatitis B for their lifetime. There is no B cure yet. Delta is an RNA virus and can be cleared, cured, self-cured, or cured with treatment that we'll talk about. But in this case, chronic infection with B, where you have super infection with Delta, you're going to have Delta infection chronic in over 90% of patients. Now, what's happened between 1980 and 2017 is we used to have a lot of acute Delta infection, symptomatic jaundice. So that would be that co-acute infection. More recently, we've got chronic delta superimposed on chronic B. So that uh, super infection has led to the much lower rate of patients presenting jaundice or fulminant or needing transplant, but chronic disease where cure uh, for delta requires usually an intervention. This, of course, now represents in our practice an older patient population an immigrant population, special risk groups. We're going to move through a little bit of this build also, severe chronic acute disease. Then there was a period of mild chronic disease where we thought, oh, Delta is not that bad. Publications between 1990 and 2000, oh, no, the risk for cirrhosis might be 10 or 20 percent. We weren't sure about a risk for liver cancer. Something happened as this disease evolved became more severe, probably because of time, not that we were really missing the severe chronic disease. But we now re really uh, respect and recognize about a 70% risk of cirrhosis in these patients and a much higher risk of liver cancer. Wow, we're going to talk a little bit about the virus now. This is an incomplete RNA virus. So this has a nice little cartoon with this double yellow greenish dumbbell uh, where it can form replicative intermediates and then move those um, messages, the RNA, out into the cytoplasm where it um, acquires the surface antigen and then uh, forms a co-membrane between surface antigen and the hepatocyte membrane components and then moves out of the cell. You can reinfect adjacent hepatocytes, or you can have circulating Delta virus with B and uh, infect another individual uh, through blood exposure of some type. Requires surface antigen, we just have to keep having that important message. Vertical transmission does occur. Sexual transmission, much more common. Infection during early childhood, probably from injections, scar practices, folk remedies, other percutaneous exposures. Medical treatments such as blood transfusions, that's a little bit old news. Um, unsterile syringes, though, reused medical uh, syringes, what I would say explains probably over half of the delta that I see. The other half have exposure with IV drug use, needle sharing. I haven't seen anybody in dialysis with delta yet but I have had tri- or quad-infected patients who may have HIV and in the hemophilia community, although that's much less uh, frequent now. Vaccinate, vaccinate, vaccinate. We need to move forward with hepatitis B eradication. Well, elimination is a better term. Eradication means no disease. Elimination means a rare disease. But to get to hepatitis B elimination, which also is going to include delta elimination, hepatitis B vaccine is key. Now this goes into a little bit more numbers that we talked about, about delta suppressing hepatitis B. It takes over the machinery of the cell, the viral replication machinery, the machinery that the virus hijacks. And we've seen this with hepatitis C as well, that hepatitis C can suppress B infection. And now that we're treating hepatitis C with DAAs, we're seeing hepatitis B reactivation. 
Now, if you treat Delta infection, right now we only have one treatment, which is interferon. It is possible to clear Delta and have a B resurgence where you may want to then put the patient on nucleoside or nucleotide analog, such as tenofovir, the new tenofovir analog called TAF or entecavir. Those are our lead drugs for B. But those drugs do not influence Delta infection. Entecavir and tenofovir have no effect on Delta, not even Adesivir, which is not being used anymore. Now, in this interesting six-panel graph from Heiner Wiedemeyer in Germany, we're looking at fluctuating patterns of viral dominance. And you are seeing some cases here where B dominates, but you're really not seeing that too much. It's really only one out of six here where, where uh, B is dominant and delta RNA is suppressed. Now, this just talks about liver disease progression. This is data from Italy, and we're talking about high risk of cirrhosis, high risk of uh, HCC, and death rate due to decompensation, death rate due to HCC. So the bottom line message is test for delta. You find delta. You're going to want to consider intervention. You're going to monitor them closely for liver failure, and you're going to do surveillance which means every six months with an ultrasound, and I'm going to recommend a liver cancer biomarker panel that includes DCP, AFP, L3, and AFP. This triple marker panel is FDA cleared for risk of liver cancer, and it would be if positive in a Delta patient uh, and you're above certain thresholds for AFP, AFP, L3, and DCP, I would be moving forward to advanced imaging, not just ultrasound, but MR with contrast. Now, we're not going to talk a lot about genotype or delta IgM because you can get delta IgM to help document acute disease, but delta IgM may remain positive long term and is correlated with more active disease. We don't have any commercial tests for genotype, but there is a difference between different genotypes. I mentioned genotype 3, higher risk of acute uh, or fulminant disease. It looks like delta, delta genotype 1 has a higher risk of progressive liver disease, lower survival. Now, the RNA of the hepatitis delta virus doesn't correlate with disease activity like hepatitis B DNA does. We know hepatitis B DNA, the higher the level, the higher the liver disease activity. But if you have RNA positive, then that patient needs to be uh, considered for treatment. And that may be treatment we'll talk about with interferon or uh, listed for the new clinical trials that are coming up. And we are encouraging people to build a mini database inside their practice and keep your eyes and ears open for new clinical trials and work with AREP, send in information that AREP may need for their delta antibody testing that reflects the RNA. Now, there's a woman named Beatrice, and they, it's interesting that they came up with a BIA score, and this is from the HDIN, Hepatitis Del Delta Investigator Network, which is a global process, and they collected information across a variety of different countries, most of it's Western Europe and Pakistan. And this is very interesting to me because they were looking very, very actively, prospectively, collecting serum, processing it well, or getting data locally. And 85% of the Delta antibody patients were RNA positive. And this is a little bit less than what we were talking about before for E antigen status. E antigen positivity was low, so most patients were E negative, probably because of viral suppression. 70% had platelet counts less than 100,000, and 60% had a high INR. This just helps reinforce you've got delta, much higher risk of cirrhosis, probably liver failure and death. And interferon, which is our only current treatment for delta, and I'm not going to say FDA approved or cleared because there hasn't been any licensing trials, but I will call it standard of care because it's the only option that we have that can result in Delta cure. So we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. 
uh, nukes do not affect delta replication. They use the diasorin antibody, which is probably our best antibody to date. It could measure down to 500 copies of the delta RNA, but had a wide range of um, uh, quantification up to 100 million. So again, CDC data. Now, I'm just going to mention briefly, and not go through all this data on this slide, but interferon is the only proven treatment that can lead to delta cure. And we quote to patients with one year of interferon that the chance of a cure is 15 to 25 percent. If the delta treatment with interferon is continued between one and five years, this is from a recent Turkish study, the cure rate can be as high as 40 percent. But you're going to ask yourself and you're going to ask me, what's the chances of somebody taking interferon for four or five years? I've only convinced one patient to take it for that long uh, at this time. Well, Delta, we want to eradicate and cure. We want to suppress B, try to get to B clearance. Interferon is still our best option for manage and clearing uh, Delta infection. There's a recent study that came up uh, from Kazakhstan, and this had uh, data that would support that the cure rate may be in the 30 to 35 percent range. A little bit more on the HIDIT trial. They did interferon uh, alone or interferon with tenofovir. And I'm just going to state that nukes don't add anything. You may want to use tenofovir or entecavir to suppress the B DNA, but you're not going to use it to try to affect the delta infection. Liver transplant is an effective way to treat delta-induced liver failure or a patient with delta and liver cancer. Interestingly, if you give that patient nucleoside analogs plus H big, delta infection in the graft is under 5%. So something happens when you take out the old graft and you're doing potential interference with uh, H big, it might prevent reinfection of that graft. Now, there was one study with tenofovir in HIV infected patients from Spain, uh, from Soriano. I don't know what to do with this data. I just want to mention it as a controversy. Um, I would say all the other data that I've seen have not shown a tenofovir effect on uh, delta infection or delta levels. Now, you have available today antibody tests through Roche or, or um, uh, Quest or LabCorp or other companies, but AREP now has a quant HCV RNA test. And there is a registration program for getting this done. If you can work through the registration, uh, and the registration is still open, which as I understand it is open now, um, you can get that test done at no cost. Or you can go to the commercial laboratories uh, that should ship this AREP. So LabCorp and Quest should have a way to ship the AREP that can help you. If you're having problems getting those things done, you can get back to the Delta Connect through the Hepatitis B Foundation, and I'll help monitor that. This is a program because there are drugs in development for Delta, and right now in the Hepatitis B world, there's 30 drugs and 20 companies. Now, Iger has been working on a special medication that looks like it affects Delta replication by inhibiting a host enzyme that's part of what's called prenylation um, in the liver. Prenylation is adding these sugar-like molecules on to different things in our bodies, but in the case of viruses, it allows the virus to be more replication competent. If you inhibit that farnesyl transferase, that's the enzyme that inhibits the prenylation, you can decrease delta RNA. Now, we have to prove these medicines can actually cure it, but there are larger studies that are going on, and the phase two data, in my opinion, supported moving forward with um, these studies. Hepatitis B Foundation has websites. They help put this conference call together. Uh, the slides should be posted on the website. Um, we are providing a partnership with AREP, and who's doing centralized HDV testing. Um, the team there I met with, I think, in 2010, trying to ask them to get the Delta process testing going forward. And with a partnership with Iger and AREP, 
of their laboratory director um, and other team members in AREP, they've actually got this assay available. The CDC assay is excellent, but you just have to fill out lots of paperwork and figure out how to get the um, specimen to the team at the CDC. It's a little bit complicated, much easier than checking a box on a, on a form. A little bit data on the Delta testing at AREP. You can look at these slides later, but they have an enzyme immunoassay for the antibody, and then they've got a PCR technique for the Delta RNA. This slide in the right column highlights the name of this prenylation inhibitor, lonafarnib. And there's much data out with the, of different lower LOWR studies showing that this drug, this prenylation inhibitor, does decrease uh, HDD RNA. And I believe in some cases uh, it's taken things undetectable. We won't call it a cure, but it's at least uh, a possibility. So Delta infection plays a very important role in liver disease, hepatitis B disease modifier, if you want to call it that, heavily concentrated in Mongolia, parts of South America, Sub-Saharan Africa, Eastern Europe, and then in countries in Southeast Asia, including Vietnam. Now this makes a very strong statement that all B patients should be tested for Delta. That probably is a little bit too strong because if you've got somebody who's got undetectable DNA for hepatitis B, ALTs 15, fibrosis scores F1, and they've had B for 20 or 30 years, I probably wouldn't be checking them for Delta, but I'm going to just emphasize have a very, very low threshold. And let's see if there's anything else important. Vaccine against hepatitis B is key. Uh, I am treating people longer than one year with interferon if they can tolerate it, and I down titrate their medication. There's some science behind this uh, process. Um, We've got new studies coming out, so keep a database, stay in touch through the FD Foundation, the Delta Connect, uh, submit your samples to AREP for RNA testing, and stay in touch with us about uh, future uh, treatment trials. So I think we're right, Sierra, where we wanted to be at quarter till, and can move to Q&A. Yes, we are. Thank you very much, Dr. Gish, for your insightful overview of hepatitis delta. And we will now begin our Q&A portion of our webinar. As mentioned at the beginning, we'll start by answering questions submitted via the chat box. And if you would like to submit a question now, please do so using the questions field on your screen. And I'll just give a, a few seconds to let any questions roll in. Maybe we answered everybody's question. So we do have a question. Um, what is the provider awareness level of HDV in general in the U.S.? And is there currently provider education for HDV management available? So we think the provider awareness is extremely low in the United States, and that is a major challenge. And I call it the rule of sevens. All of you are on this phone call. You're all very smart people, but you're going to probably have to hear about Delta five times before you start testing routinely. We do have resources. This uh, slide deck will be available through the Hepatitis B Foundation website. And there's now like, an audio presentation that you can share through this link with your team. And there's other ways to get more Delta uh, talks, Delta information. You can contact me through the Hepatitis B Foundation and the Delta Connect. Uh, there's the AREP team on their testing. Uh, there's an IGER website uh, where you can get information on drug development that's there. There's a Delta library that's available, so to speak, through PubMed. And those articles can be shared. There's some great review articles out on Delta that are in the public domain. So let's work together to spread the word, so to speak, uh, using an infectious disease metaphor, and uh, get that uh, word out and testing done and find these 70 to 90,000 people. Absolutely. Thank you very much. So we do have some more questions. Uh, what could be the reason behind higher prevalence of HDV in specific regions? For example, the 30% prevalence rate in Pakistan in those studies. I believe Pakistan and Mongolia 
are because of reusable medical devices. And in some cultures, and Egypt's an example, although Egypt doesn't have a high Delta infection, is what they have is called hyperinjectors. There are cultures that believe that medications only work if they're given by injection. So I want my B12 shot, it's got to be by uh, injection. I have an antibiotic for a cold, I'm not going to take a pill. I need an injection. And then if you go to these hyperinjector clinics where everything has, all medicines have to be given by injection and people are reusing needles or syringes or IV tubing, uh, that's where it's going to happen. Now, there are other practices that people use, including acupuncture, uh, sharp devices, scarification. There's different types of mutilation that take place with sharps that are shared with razors and other things. But I think medical injections is number one, although I can't say that in Amazonia and the Orinoco River Valley in Venezuela that medical injections are the dominant because these are uh, remote aboriginal people that are pretty far removed from anything approaching Western medicine. So I think in those groups it easily could be sharps and scarification. Right, very interesting. So we have another question as well. Does a co-infected person always transmit both viruses to another person? Great question. So to be co-infected, you have to document that they're delta RNA positive, even though the B level may be low or undetectable. But yes, when they transmit infection and they're delta infected and they're delta replicating, it's highly likely that they're going to transmit B and delta at the same time. And this has to do with the fact that Delta dominates. And when you are Delta infected, you tend to have moderate to high levels of Delta RNA. And that's your dominant virus. But you got to have B to carry it. So yes, co-infection predominates in that high-risk setting. Right. Another question. Do you recommend testing for pregnant women uh, for HDV if they are HBSAG positive and immigrants from an endemic region? And can you protect a baby both B and D? So the first question is, I'm going to look at that pregnant woman and say, is she at risk for Delta? So if she's from West Africa, Horn of Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, she's going to get Delta antibody testing and then reflex RNA. Same thing as I have a pregnant woman from Romania that surface antigen positive. I'm going to say immigrant from Romania, could have Delta, needs to be tested. What if I have a pregnant woman uh, who's from Cambodia, but she looks like she has advanced fibrosis on scan? I'll be checking her for Delta, even though Delta is low prevalence in Southeast Asia. There are pockets, and the best screening test test for Delta in that group is advanced fibrosis. Now, if you protect against B with vaccine, vaccine plus H big, or in rare cases with nucleoside or nucleotide analogs such as tenofovir, you will prevent Delta infection because you've prevented B infection, and with no B infection, you can't have Delta. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, Another question, um, is there a, a known reason of higher incidence of HDV in males versus females? Well, this is a very, very interesting question because if you look at populations in general, men have B at a prevalence rate that's higher than women. And so if you're looking at a given population that's got a high B prevalence rate, it's usually 60, 40 men to women. We're not sure. Are estrogens protective? Uh, do women have different cytokine profiles that are protective? Uh, is the immune system in women different than men towards viruses that allows viral clearance to take place? So it might be that Delta is following B. B is higher in men, so Delta will be higher in men. That's going to be my uh, shoot from the hip estimate. Mm -hmm. So one final question. Um, since the antibody test is so easily done, why has it not been done more extensively? Well, one problem we have is that people look to our international organizations, such as AASLD, EASL, and APOSL, 
tests or guidelines on delta testing. And delta testing hasn't been part of the guidelines or guidance document. Now, the people that are currently leading these guidance documents and writing those, and ASLD will come out with their part two, hopefully uh, by this summer. I don't know exactly what the timeline is, but I've been in contact with a couple of the leads on that, which include Dr. Nora Turo and Tram Tran, asking them for a specific statement on delta testing, when delta testing should be done. And if it gets into the guidance documents, it gets into slides, it gets into um, a variety of other settings. And then we can talk about getting testing more broad-based. And But I'm going to ask this audience to be ahead of the guidelines, be ahead of the guidance document. Since we have all this information about Delta, we can make decisions in our practice without having the guidance document necessarily being available to tell us what to do or what direction to go. But I think that's going to be a really good catch up within the next six to 12 months. Right. Definitely exciting things to come. So we'll go ahead and let uh, Dr. Gish uh, just have an ending statement to close out the webinar. And then, um, yeah, go ahead. Thank you, Sierra. Thanks for all your help. And we want to thank the participants for this. And we have to keep in mind that we have 70 to 90,000 people with Delta infection in the U.S. Eliminating Delta should be part of the viral hepatitis elimination plan. There's going to be a big meeting that will be broadcast online at the end of the month from the CDC, which is called VHAC, and I'll definitely be asking questions about Delta there because right now C is dominant, B is in second place, but we want to keep Delta in that top three. We have an antibody test that's available through all the different commercial labs. So whether you go to LabCorp, Quest, Mayo, ARIP, there's other labs that are out there. Get that Delta antibody testing done. It's inexpensive. And any patient that surface antigen positive that you think is at risk for Delta, and remember our simple rules, advanced liver disease, they all get Delta testing if they're B positive. If they're B positive and immigrants from special regions, again, sub-Saharan Africa, Eastern Europe, Mongolia, Pakistan, and the Indian subcontinent, and special places in South America, although I don't think you'll be seeing anybody from Amazonia in the near future. We also are going to think about Delta infection in somebody who's suppressed on B medications, such as Entecavir or Tenofovir, but their liver enzymes remain high. Obviously, you need to take an alcohol history, a fatty liver assessment, but Delta's got to be right up front there, and it's so inexpensive, and if antibody is positive, reflex to now a high quality quantitative delta RNA testing through ARUP. Sierra, thank you very much. You can see all the wonderful supporters that were posted on this slide. And mm -hmm. there is a little bit of housekeeping, Sierra. I think you need to do a wrap. Is that correct? Yep, absolutely. Thank you so much, Dr. Gish, for your uh, time and great information today. So I know we weren't able to answer all of the questions today, um, but please don't hesitate to contact us directly. Um, our email is up on our screen, and you can also check out our website, www.hepdconnect.org, and our corresponding social media channels. And on an ending note, thank you all so, so much for participating today. And please remember to fill out the post-webinar survey uh, that will pop up at the end of the webinar. And it also includes opportunities for patients and providers to receive information about um, clinical trials and free testing for hepatitis D for your HBV patients. So thank you all again and have a great rest of your day.